and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. They are part of the multi-headed monster currently developing Spiritfall. In the red corner, we've got Kyle Watt, and in the blue corner, we've got Ben, we've got Benjamin. No, he's not short. Webster, how you two doing today, man? I'm pretty good, thanks. And actually, I am kind of short. You're not as short as Webster. <laughs> 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 hey, he's kind of close. I find that hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, short Wait till I get a little me. older and start shrinking. I mean, short compared to me, but everybody's short compared to me. <laughs> but, so, so, um, I do want to thank you guys for being open to doing this and for braving the hell of time zones. So let's of course, thank you for having us. Let's start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. You want to go first, Brad, or you want me to? Uh, you can go first. Um, mine is the classic story of uh, finding strange books in the basement of my house and going, Hey, Dad, what's this? What are these weird-shaped dice? Uh, and uh, learning about the magic of Dungeons & Dragons at a very early age. Mm -hmm. It's surprisingly um, similar. <laughs> Uh, and I think it took until about college for me to branch out into non D and D related RPGs. Um, we played some Stars Without Number. Um, we've looked into uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics. Um, we played some weird ones uh, like uh, Fate, um, and uh, we keep coming back. And now you're doing something that is as far removed from th from that particular. Um pitfall as you can get with Spiritfall. I don't know if I'd say that far removed, but it is definitely a less forgiving beast than some of the other games uh, we've played. You've played Star Wars Without Number. That's not exactly forgiving. That's I true. know. <laughs> <laughs> but what... But, um... That's one. That's one half of. The, that's one half of the equation. And as far as the, as far as far as you, Ben, what about you? Well, it, it did start off very similarly. Um, when I was really little, my dad showed me some of his old Dungeons and Dragons books and wanted to know if I wanted to play. I was like, that sounds cool. Um, so my sister and I, my dad DM'd for us. My sister promptly lost interest in that sort of thing, and. Um, and then my dad and I kept doing that for a while, and once I got to be get around like high school, college age, um, I started running with a crowd of people who all, were also into tabletop games. And very similarly to Kyle, I got into Stars of That Number. I think it was in the same game we were in, right, Kyle? Yeah. That's yeah. how I met you. Wait, you met me through that game? I thought we met yeah. before that. <laughs> Huh. All right. Well, shows my memories going. But yeah, we uh, we met in that Stars Without Number game, and then that was kind of what kicked it off. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, to, since you are a two man team, I do have to ask the unfortunate question of which one to use the Abbot and which one to use the Costello. Um. Uh, I unfortunately have to play the straight man in our in our group here. <laughs> Much to my dismay, the reluctant moral compass. Man, I could I I went easy on you. I could have asked who's the tank. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but I'm the healer. <laughs> no, what's no? Who's the tank? What's the mage? I don't know. Who's the priest? We're not talking about him. All right, I'll have to. I'll have to unlock my memory. You bring in some deep cuts early in. <laughs> yeah. 
What, you guys have never heard who's on first? Oh, of course. I, I, oh my god. That's a team member. And, and I played um, during the time when Who's the Tank was making the rounds. Mm -hmm. I just haven't thought about that in 15 years. <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 used that I've used that gag quite a bit because um, the classics never die. And <laughs> especially, especially with especially with newcomers who go to, who go into my LGS, um, just so I can watch them go absolutely insane. I think you'll find we'll already we are already there. Your game designers <laughs> that was that was already a given. Yeah. <laughs> Insanity and masochism are matters of course. That's why I never ask if a particular person designing a game is insane kind of a moot point. Very fair. Now, was it a when it came to the development of Spiritfall, was this something that you guys had designed recently or at least the idea recently or was this something that you had in the back foot for a while? Spiritfall has been in development in various uh, stages for about 10 years or so now. Mm -hmm. Um uh, I, uh, a friend of ours um, who uh, I knew from high school had uh, started working on the project. I helped him uh, for a while. Um, we had like an alpha and a beta that kind of worked, but it didn't really do what we wanted to do. It was very based on Call of Cthulhu. Um, you know, it had a D100 system and very uh, like uh, the demons were very old gods insanity um sort of flavor um and it didn't quite play how we wanted it to uh, so we scrapped it all and we set it again um we worked on that for a while we went to a couple of conventions um the feedback we got was um you know players really like to roll dice um and we're asked you're asking them to roll dice all the time but you're telling them that failing failure is happening almost all the time so that feels bad and they were 100 percent right uh, so we redesigned it a second time, and now we're really happy with it. Um, and during that time, we've looked at, you know, dozens and dozens of different, you know, uh, tabletop games. And uh, we're able to steal the good parts that we liked uh, and learn more. Because um, the first thing you make is not good. You should never show that to the public. <laughs> I've shown, um, I've, I've, I, I still have the first video I've done up on this channel because I'm not... I'm not hiding the fact that my that my audio was shit back then. <laughs> That's true masochistic tendencies that is, yeah. bearing your older abilities like that. <laughs> Why not? I got nothing to hide. Then you are a braver man than I. Besides, <laughs> I have like, very I have very many things to hide. <laughs> did I not just say a few seconds ago that game design that masochism <laughs> and game design go hand in hand? <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but since Spiritfall is doing a post-apocalypse that is very, very much um, rooted in New York. Yes. Um, yep. I guess I'm, I, I'm go I'm going to go out on a limb, and I and I say this because I don't trust the location entry on any Kickstarter, just as a part of point of principle. You got you guys are born and bred New York Cityers, or just New or just New York State in general. Close, um, Jersey. We're from out. I I live not far from the city. Jersey. Uh, yeah. My sympathies. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Look, year, years of di one of my bit one of my dear friends is a hardcore Devils fan, so I have to hear it a lot. So uh, make, make of that yeah. what you will. <laughs> I used to be a hardcore Devils fan when I was a small child because I had a New Jersey Devils like kid-sized hockey stick, and I thought they had a cool logo, and that was my entire reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. But with the but with that in mind, <laughs> the big reason I asked is be, is because in the demo booklet for Spiritfall, you have a mini you have a a bit of a mini map of of a, of particular areas and yep. an emphasis yep. on the um, on, on the under the um, underground networks, which yes. 
Uh, well, it's actually it's actually just any connection between mm-hmm. the neighborhoods, not just the subway maps. Yeah, I, I guess the I guess the closest analog I could make is the emphasis on the metro network in well the metro books. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. Was that a coincidence on my part, or or were the metro books an influence? It was absolutely uh, an influence and a, and a style guide for sure. I I could I could certainly see it and obviously and, and yeah I, ju- I to double I do double check the map itself since a lot of times when I get when I get um quick starts it's usually a, a single PDF not um se- not separated the way this was almost like a box set that was the that was the goal of the feel or the that was the feel that was our goal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, which is again, which is going to be good because obviously not everybody who's going to be picking this up is going to be as familiar with the boroughs of New York City as you as you guys are. So having sure. that and having that emphasis on this post-apocalyptic New York as a living place is vital. Now, our goal is to make it feel like a dungeon crawl through the boroughs of New York. Mm-hmm. And if I if I recall, one of the other, there's one of the other things is you are dealing instead of like zombies or something. You guys went with demons, mm-hmm. all the, with the idea of um them be them being man, manifestations of of people's sins why why did you guys go with demons was it as a means to do something unique because everybody's done zombies over the last 20 years it kind of offered a few interesting like mechanical Mm -hmm. choices that we wanted to work with as far as design goes as well because we also have the herald mechanics for their coming as well Mm -hmm. so it's not just they pop in and wreck stuff, which they do. But also, it allows opportunities for, like, building tension with the party and allowing players to see the threat coming and prepare around it and work together a little bit to strategize in different ways than usual. Yeah. It also, um... The game is is very clearly uh, Judeo-Christian influenced. Right and um, major monotheistic you know, ones, yeah. Yeah, that was um, you know one of our like design influences. We thought it would be really interesting to have these sort of uh, biblical uh, demons showing up at the end times and what that could mean for for players who are religious or not um, dealing with whatever that means for them as a role play opportunity. Yeah. Now there's. There's a few things that really ended up draw- really ended up drawing my attention. Um, one of the one of the bi- one of the big things is the fact that you guys are using a d a d six system, but it's ver- it's very much a case where you're tr- where um unless I'm unless I misunderstand it, the goal is. Roll, roll a number of d6 equal to your stat. Um, if any of them show sixes, you fail. Otherwise, you pass. Uh, that's pretty close. Um, for... Um, uh, we have... I think we're calling it a... a you know, it's a stress-based system. Mm-hmm. So if you roll more than half, the next time you roll, you're going to roll an additional die. Um, so this means at the start of your mission, um, you're you know you're rolling your die. You have a really high chance of success. You know you only have one die to get at your six on. But as it goes on, as you make more and more tests, you're going to be uh, more exhausted. You're going to have more stress, and you have a higher chance of failure as you're trying to return from your mission. And that was sort of the feel we're going for. Yeah. Is that the longer your mission goes, the harder it's going to be for you to, to succeed. And I, I do have to correct myself because I had it in my because of the, some of the dice images on the Kickstarter page I had it in my head that this is a pool based affair when really if I'm reading 
like some of the example sheets, right? It's more that it's more that you're rolling one, maybe two, maybe two dice. De yeah, depending on how high your stress gets, we cap it at five, um, out of kindness, um, <laughs> and math, mostly math. Yeah. Um, uh, and also as your uh, uh, as your character levels up, uh, they can improve these skills to become a higher die size. Mm -hmm. So if you get better, you can become a D eight, D ten, or even a D twelve. Yeah. So that you have better chances of success, even when you're in those high stress situations, because this is your character's bread and butter. This is what they're good at. They're good under pressure. They'll be all right. Yeah, since if you don't mind me going a bit ma going a bit math nerd, a obviously a D four, you got a twenty five percent chance of failing. Mm -hmm. um, a D six, I believe that would be twenty percent. Uh, what was it against? Like seventeen, yeah. right? 17 yep. yeah yep. 16 points 16 point six repeating or just yeah 16 point yeah. 67 for the purpose of our sanity um <laughs> a d8 that'd be 12 and a half a d10 well that'd be just 10 yeah <laughs> and a d12 the lonely d12 <laughs> um eight and a third yep yep so, which does does mean that there's a higher risk for failure compared to some other games, but the, but um, I'd say I'd say that it's more about it's more about how far you're willing to push it because it's it sounds like as you get str as you get stressed you're rolling more dice. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, and one of the things we also um uh, encourage and we sort of. Uh, emphasize to to our game masters in in you know their side of our book um, is not to encourage the players to roll all the time to roll for everything. We only want to roll if the uh, the chance of failure uh, of that event is going to be detrimental to a player. If whether in terms of how much time it's going to take, uh, you know, a risk of injury or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be, oh, there's a five foot gap. You know, everybody roll to see if maybe someone fails and they fall in. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, it, we only want to roll when it's going to be um, sort of uh, really important to the narrative. Because uh, if we roll all the time, no one's coming back alive. Yeah. Yeah. And with the, with that in mind. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up one of the defining rules with how equipment works, and that is schlock. Where yes. you, where um certain die th certain um certain equipment that has the schlock descriptor ha has a chance of ju of just um failing, decay decaying, or just not working because these things are slapped together with duct tape and prayer. Yeah, exactly. They're, it, it's very similar to the way skills work. It's, you know, you roll the maximum number and it stops working. It's another way of adding tension to the usage of the items so that it's not just, oh, I have this get out of jail free card for this specific situation. Mm -hmm. If you have something of this grade of material, it, it's still something that could potentially wind up being a problem. It is, as you said before, a matter of like, how far are you willing to push your luck? And the, now, when it comes to skills, is it a case where you're rolling both the core and the skill, or are you just rolling the skill? You just roll one or the other, typically. Like, the skill is something that you want to do. Like, if you want to jump a gap, or if you want to climb, you know, like a, a jagged rock face or something to that effect, that's you rolling your skill for doing that action. The The rolling for your cores, that's typically something that's inflicted upon you. Like, if some effect damages your body or your mind or your spirit, then you're rolling something similar to a saving throw to resist that. Mm -hmm. Oh. Which de definitely makes sense. It's I think when you have it that you can roll one or the other, it's important to nail down why someone would want to roll. You know, like, looking at say Aisha who has a who has a body of d8 
but at the, but um the traverse of d6 there's the question of why would why would i roll why would i um why would i roll traverse when i could roll body right and, right, and that's why the players choices are mostly their skills and on top of that even though it's not necessarily a hard resource cap in like just for example, like maybe a spell slot or something, there's not a finite amount of times you could use something, you might not necessarily want to use your higher bread and butter skill at the first opportunity, just because you know you might make it less effective for the next opportunity. And so a lot of uh, solutions are environmental based. Mm -hmm. So instead of rolling, we found that players often say, okay, let me scavenge around, can I find some planks of wood that have fallen off of a scaffolding or you know can i use my equipment to get through this so that they can save their roles for when they really need them and they have a better chance of succeeding um so it's it really forces the creativity in all of our uh hazards and ob obstacles that are in the neighborhoods mm -hmm. now y instead of using um instead of using a hard map you guys are using a zone based system I'd yeah. like to go into that and and see how, how see if that is that a case of like a like a free form area. What what do you define as a zone? And I realize that's a question that's going to be very broad. It is intentionally broad. Um, the the only thing we say is that each zone should have a landmark that it can be done potentially in theater of mind. So uh, maybe a zone could be the area around a, a fountain. Or it could be a gymnasium, mm -hmm. right? Whatever whatever scale it needs to be, it could be a closet, um, depending on sort of the scope of whatever environment the players need to be in. Um, we we leave it up to whatever situation they find themselves in, because uh, we don't want to say, you know, that if we if we put hard and fast rules in a zone, we're sort of getting into a nitty gritty that's not quite important. Um, and we'd rather focus on letting the story unfold. Yeah, now, when it comes to specializations, um, yeah. like, like what, where's the, where's the dividing line? Where's the advantage between a skill versus a specialization? Is, is it that specializations are more focused, but you are able to use them more safely in regard to stress, or is there something different that separates them? It is not every player at the table is going to have access to every specialization. Um, so specializations depend on whatever background you have. Um, so some backgrounds include construction worker, mm -hmm. um, right? And so they're going to have different uh, backgrounds than uh, the uh, architect or uh, the sewage uh, worker. Um, and so all the different specializations, uh, each background gets one. And so that is sort of their niche that they get to fill. Uh, and some of these specializations have weird supernatural uh, aspects to them um, that aren't really obvious. So um, uh, it turns out that with painting, uh, you're able to write demonic runes and have supernatural abilities. You could also play these runes on a, on an instrument. Um, if you have uh, a music um, specialty. Or um, you can uh, speak them if you have the oration uh, specialty. Mm -hmm. And they all do different things depending on how you uh, decide to access these runes. Yeah. Now... Go now. Um, there's. Oh, I want to shift into combat a little bit because there's one aspect within it that I did find. I did find very interesting. Oh, and that it that is the damage effects where you can add extra effects if you max out damage dice. Which was that in part a way to ha have it that something that would do like D four damage still has a means of contribution. Uh, yeah, 
Absolutely. Because uh, we wanted to keep sort of the damage. The damage numbers have to be small because mm -hmm. our health pools are small. Um, we also wanted to sort of tie it in um, where basically every time you roll a high number, for you roll the maximum number for any die in the game, something happens. You know, for a skill, right, that means failure. Um, right, so when you roll a, your highest here, well, we felt like something should happen uh, as well, and so we have our damage effects that we get to apply, um, which is used by everything in the game. There are dozens of damage effects that different creatures have, um, which are really only applied if they get to roll maximum. Mm -hmm. Now, the other... Now, one thing I didn't see is an equivalent to initiatives. So is it a case where participants are still going to be rolling initiative, or is it a shared thing? Is it initiative a shared thing, or is it like popcorn initiative? What angle are you guys going with? I was going to let Ben take that one, but I'll jump in again. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had to field a question from my sister real quick. Oh, no worries. Um, it is, uh, yeah, it's, it is popcorn initiative with one sort of asterisk on that, uh, where you just have to pass the turn to someone on the other side. Um, so whichever side is narratively has the advantage at the start, whichever one gets the jump on the other, they go first and they pass to the other side. And uh, if there's no one left to pass to, you can pick whoever on your side goes next. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings... That brings me to the uh, the obvious next part, and that is, is it a case where everybody's doing one action period, or do you have something of a action economy? Um, it is uh, one action and one movement that you can mm -hmm. do. Um, so you can move a zone and then do an action. Um, you know, whether it is, you know, uh, attack, uh, you can help somebody, um, right, you can hide... Um, use equipment, whatever it is. Uh, but one movement, one action. All right, I, uh, can, I can certainly get that. Uh, or use one of your many, as you level up, traits that you get. Um, some of which happen as a part of your action. Um, some of which replace the action entirely. Yeah. Now, one of the things that really drew my attention was on the Kickstarter and in, and in some of the materials there's talk about an emphasis on team synergy and te and teams were and the players acting as a combined unit mm -hmm. yes in, instead of a bunch of individuals so what what prompted that and how and how do you guys plan on um, realizing that particular vision it offers a sort of uh, what's the word, like a more collaborative effort between players at the table. So rather than just kind of waiting around for your turn to whack something, it it really emphasizes a means of players working together to accomplish a goal. And to that end, there are a lot of effects that take place in the game that obviously buff that and take advantage of players helping one another. And when they do so exceptionally well they can increase their team synergy, you know, literally on their team sheet, which gives them access to other abilities, traits, and sometimes it can even affect turn order, so it's not necessarily that you're passing exclusively to an enemy, but you can sometimes also pass to an ally as well. And it helps, it just helps the, the players feel like they're more impactful as a group rather than just trying to outshine one another by doing the most damage, sure, etc. And uh, mechanically, um, as you're going out on your missions, we have the uh, synergy tracker, right? Which, um, as the group um, uh, is in situations where they're working really well together, they dominate against the enemy, um, something like that. Um, and we have a whole list of what causes that on, on what we call the team sheet, which was one of the many packets in our demo box. Mm -hmm. um, right, so as that goes up, you get access to some of those abilities uh, that Ben talked about. Um, but that's our mechanical way of saying, you guys have worked together at a team, this is how we're going to encourage it, because um, it feels really bad to play a role-playing game, and you have that one guy who 
ruined the plan that you guys just spent 90 minutes hashing out. Um, <laughs> and so now he gets to have fun, but unfortunately the rest of you get to sit back. Um, when that happens here, it's, it's incentivized that you all are really working together. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that's the reason you have both bond, tension, and synergy, which I'm guess I'm guessing tension and synergy are are um, something that can in that can increase or decrease independently. This isn't um, two Correct. ends of a scale. Correct. Um, tension and synergy are our mission-based trackers, mm -hmm. uh, whereas bond is sort of our long-term uh, thing. It's really it's really a measure of how much trauma has your group taken um and if it's too much then you guys retire yeah now are there are there any benefits that can be gained from individual bond points or is it or is it just how far just how far away from um minus five where the campaign ends is it is uh different uh bond traits um are unlocked only when you reach a certain bond. Um, and so the higher bond you have, you get the highest level bond traits. You can do the coolest things. Um, and let me let me actually give you a real example and pull it up for you. Um, so something that requires one bond uh, would be you can, you know, draw the attention of some enemy and force them to focus on you for a round. Um, whereas something that takes, um, five bond is, uh, you can, once per mission, let everybody on your team take a second turn this round before having to pass to another enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, when it comes to, when it comes to, um, bond traits... I'm guessing the I'm guessing these are going to be the main way that players um, personalize what they can bring to the table. Uh, one of the ways, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some of the more supernatural uh, things. Uh, we mentioned runes a little bit. Um, we also have temptation traits, which are uh, when uh, you get a little whisper from one of the demons, mm -hmm. and if you uh, if you listen to the bad things that they say, they'll reward you with a lot of power. Sometimes that's good. I saw... Grab a cushion, because I feel a butt coming. <laughs> oh, what? No! <laughs> oh. Yeah, obviously. Uh, all all supernatural abilities come at a consequence. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, temptation traits are um, uh, the, the words are so hard. Um, are we so sure temptation traits. First language. No, I told you the Brazilian's better. <laughs> I am I am the worst at English of the people who have made this book. And it is, and I was born in Jersey. <laughs> um, so, uh, in general, uh, a temptation trait is sort of a benefit to you, uh, but at the consequence of your team members. Um, so something like maybe uh, you get to do uh, a cool thing. Um, you know, maybe you get this ghostly armor, but if your ghostly armor bursts, it knocks down your nearby teammates and it knocks them prone for a bit. If you ever take too much damage, that it breaks. Um, uh, whereas the runes are generally helpful to your whole team, uh, but are a detriment to you. Uh, so maybe you take some damage, but you get to clear a pathway through some supernatural bramble. A lot of the mechanics in this game involve a trade-off of sorts. What you can afford to spare in that moment to get you more long-term benefit. Hence why I had to make the grab a cushion joke. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing comes for free in the demon apocalypse. Yeah. Now, given how much of a big deal faith is and how and how um, demons can appear through um, the presence of sin, I'm gu I'm guessing that um, faith is faith is more than just say your 
say your mental HP it can have its own um, effects. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Ben, go I'm for also it. a little confused as well. I apologize. Um, what I'm what do you mean? I'm cur I'm curious because I know that I see that there's some effects where that can cost um, faith, mm -hmm. and I'm mm -hmm. cu I'm curious if um, if on the other end of the spectrum there are certain traits or the like that do rely on on the use of, on not the use in terms of spending but the presence of certain threshold oh. of faith at the very least, i.e. Yes. the yeah. different ways that faith can be used in-game. Tell them all about trinkets, Ben. You take this one. Oh my god, trinkets. Um, let me pull up some trinkets, actually, because it's um, been a minute. All right, all right. As, he, as he does that, uh, so our trinkets are a potential sort of good luck charm, right? That's their, that's their thing. Uh, you know, the apocalypse happened, and we've just decided as humans, we're just going to buy into every superstition that's ever existed. Some of them are going to work, and it turns out some of them really do. But it's, some of them only work if your faith is high enough. Mm -hmm. So if you have your faith at, you know, the base level of 10, not all of these are going to work. Whereas if you raise that up to higher, more and more of them are going to be real uh trinkets that give you some sort of benefit warn you of danger uh allow you to see through the winding safe zones better gives you better options um uh stuff like that would that would that kind of thing mean that is mean that somebody who is a full-on um, exorcist would be would be a significant threat to demons in this setting being a threat to demons <laughs> is not something that players are likely to achieve in a meaningful capacity very quickly. You can um, combat demons, but yeah. they're generally a situation gone terribly wrong, you should get out of there now kind of deal. Yeah. So, nemesis. Effectively. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I can, I can certainly make sense out of it. Out of that, um, especially get especially given the the motif that you guys have of the of superstition and the like being very very real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, on the on the G, on on the GM side of things, I'm ge I'm guessing you guys have a a fair, a fair few um, hazards as well as well as threats that you're put that you're putting in, are most of them built around just having a die for mind, body, and spirit, or do some of them have something f further than that? Uh, in terms of the the threats or the obstacles, like um... yeah, sen essentially the st the stat block of something. For oh, of a better okay. Word. Okay, uh, so it depends on what the something we're talking about is. Mm -hmm. um, we have we have stat blocks for environmental hazards, um, which are something like let's pick our favorite one, Ben. Uh, waterfalls. Waterfalls, yeah. <laughs> waterfalls. Waterfalls. Um, so in an environmental hazard, uh, each of the uh, features of that environmental hazard are going to have a mind, body, and spirit, and that's how they're going to try to cause harm or slow down or entrap the party. Um, right, so the waterfalls have something called raging, riv raging rivers. Uh, and so the flooded streets, there are rapids, and they quickly change direction and they try to split the team apart, mm -hmm. uh, which raises the tension of the situation, both narratively and mechanically. Um, there are powerful whirlpools which can suck a team member in and require help uh, from another person to get them out Right mm -hmm. when they get stuck, tension raises uh, and then our absolute favorite feature of the game is the four dimensional waterfalls why four dimensional? because we wanted them to uh, be able to phase in and out of reality and we really are a bunch of math nerds 
And well, we love, am, we love, all right, maybe Ben's not. <laughs> <laughs> I am the complete opposite of a math nerd. Um, and uh, we got really into, um, uh, you know, uh, projection, fourth dimension, projection to third dimension, and we decided we were going to roll with it, and all demons are four-dimensional creatures. And so their supernatural hazards are all four-dimensional hazards. And so these waterfalls come in and out of reality and can sweep a team member away. Um, but something like an actual creature, um, so um, something like uh, a hellhound uh, or a nightmare would have, uh, in addition to their mind, body, and spirit, they have some skills, they'll have life, they might have armor, and they'll have different attacks like you would see in a normal creature stat block. Yes, mm -hmm. but by and large, the things that are not creatures would not have access to skills. They are just things that exist. Most yeah. generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Now, mo now moving in, moving in from from that, because um, I do I do see a few I do few a few more standard obstacles. Um, one mm -hmm. of them, one of them, of course, being a bear. Yep. Because, because, well, what's going to be? Well, hope, hopefully, it's not a. Um, hopefully, it's a, a, only a black bear and not a grizzly bear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, where, where else would you? Uh, what else would you find in a bodega but a bear? I, mm -hmm. I don't really know. Yeah, but I'm get I'm. Because of the fact that a lot of the encounters are built more on environment, I'm guessing that in the GM side of the material, you're going to have some um, advice and some pointers on how GMs could build environments and the threats within them. Yeah. Uh, we give uh, something around a um, hundred or so pre-built ones, some of them being uh, environmental hazards um, like uh, brambles or haunted construction equipment, um, different timed obstacles, which is what we call our, like, normal combat. So we give you different, um, you know, uh, factions that could exist or creatures, and, uh, and we, we build you uh, a situation or sort of our wandering events. So something like a, a nomad, a traveling salesman, or something as weird as um, these two people really want to bone they want to bone so hard but they need someone to marry them because it's a sin to bone before marriage and they're going to beg you to to marry them so that they can go off and bone mm -hmm. um and at the end of our our uh gm's book uh we give you our sort of step-by-step -step process of how we came up with them um what makes these things um interesting what makes it fit in with uh, sort of the different rules that we have, how we can apply the things. Um, and so we give you the guides of how we made our things so that you can make the stuff yourself. Um, and we have that for all of the content. We have a how-to guide on how you can make it so that when you run out of our stuff, you can do your own. I can, I can certainly get that. Now, with that in, with that in mind... Because I did, I did see the die size for how big a feature is, and I'm guessing you have a similar thing with these with these kind of advice to make sure that um, things are relatively fair. I'm not saying that there should be yes. balanced encounters. <laughs> this isn't that kind of game. Yeah, exactly. But um, you know, but you're not going to have somebody turn a corner and then all of a sudden having to do with a with a greater demon or something. Correct. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, if you want to run your game like that, that's fine. But if your players run away from you, that is your fault, not ours. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now, one of the big things that's brought that's brought up on the on the character sheet is memories. And I th I think there was there was something in the core book about how, or at least not the core book, the um, booklets. About how people have lo have lost their memory after what happened when the demons showed up and wrecked everything. Yes. So I'm guessing that play that um the use of memories plays a big deal in um in both downtime and 
to a certain extent during active play when they're out outside the safe zones? Absolutely. It provides a lot of narrative opportunity for the players so that they can find something to investigate on their missions, something to potentially bond over. It is a way for them to mark down things that they care about as characters as well, and that provides a lot of like narrative roleplay opportunities. What do they want to get out of these missions in addition to just keeping the safe zone and their people alive? What truly keeps them going personally? Um, and uh, we have a few things which mechanically play on that. Um, so you only get a few memories of the before times um, to start with, and it's it's in your background. Um, so something like, you know, when, if you're a taxi driver, you remember one of your uh, patrons, right? One of the people you drove and some story they told. Uh, maybe you remember uh, a moment you had with your significant other. Mm -hmm. um and as the game goes on there are different things you can do where you can get another memory maybe you could learn more about this thing uh, but there are also creatures and hazards out there that can take these memories for from you some of them forcibly sometimes you can give up uh, a memory something you hold dear in exchange for safety or power um and so that is a much harder uh, uh question for a player than Oh, do I want to? I'll gladly hurt myself. I'll take damage to go get power any time. But if you ask a player, would you forget your mother to get out of this situation alive? That is a much more difficult question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and i i could i could I could certainly see that. Now, with that in mind, what are you guys shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Oh boy. Uh, probably in the ballpark of about 275. Mm -hmm. Which includes, like, I'd say probably about half of that is just content. Um, yeah. Creatures and obstacles that we give you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, traits. Yeah. Most, most of that is, is pre-made content. And I do, f I do find it interesting that you guys on the on the Kickstarter are also including a player's book. That's not, if I'm reading this right, it's not far removed from the player's guide that Cipher does with some of their books, where it's just the player facing material in the core book. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's it's um, it's so so the GM can keep some of their secrets for the group they want to play with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so they can give out, um, you know, all the player rules, and they can keep all of the demons and the fun threats to themselves. I've I've given out some of my secrets. It's just that all of them are mirror written or similarly ciphered. <laughs> <sighs> Unfortunately, I play with some really clever players. Um, one's getting his PhD in physics. If you hand him a cipher, he's going to spend the next week deciphering it instead of doing his his work. And it becomes a whole thing. I definitely don't know from experience. <laughs> oh. Well, every every cipher has a every cipher has a key, and I, I only bring up the mirror writing thing because I did that for a for a um, pa for a paper in college because my professor was dumb enough to have April Fool's Day as the due date. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. So then the thing was twenty. The thing was like. 20 pages long in in mirror written double sided oh man i mean i still technically did the assignment i just did it's just i had i decided to have a bit of extra fun yeah it's turned it on time it's done it's just hard to read oh uh, i got called out in front of everybody about, about it and without missing a beat i told him why you said april 1st for the due date <laughs> <laughs> uh, i did I got a passing grade out of it. I think I think because he didn't want to admit that I had outwitted him. <laughs> but there was the whole thing of this was brilliant, never do this again. Yeah. So I can under I can understand that kind of um fixation. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm on the other side of that in my day job. So uh, I understand his uh 
his reluctance very well. You can't admit it, because that encourages it. <laughs> right. And although some sometimes I'll sometimes I'll drag out a puzzle just to just to make a really bad pun. <laughs> oh, like I had, I had written I had written one out that was a that was a cipher, but if you translate it, it it just says necromance. If you want to, we can bring your friends to life, but your friends aren't dead, and if they're not dead, then they're no friends of mine. <laughs> And everybody just looks at me and says nothing for about for about ten seconds, as my players figured it out. That's definitely my style as well. Because <laughs> if I'm not fucking with my players, am I really doing my job? Right, they gotta have something to keep them on their toes. Or, um, I would I would build I would ha I would have traps in a dungeon, but the trap actually does nothing. <laughs> You know, it's or traps that are meant to that you disarm it, and the disarming was the trigger for another trap. In the case of the do nothing, I did. I told them that it does nothing, but in reality, it was because I forgot. I forgot that I had laid a trap there. <laughs> it's always fun when people look for traps, and then no matter whether or not they succeed or fail on the roll, you say there don't appear to be any. This is so intentionally vague that they're gonna still worry about it no matter what. Um. Uh, yeah, and of co of course that's the reason why we why we have the infamous gazebo incident. Oh man! I attacked the gazebo. Um, it's a gazebo. <laughs> right. That's why I'm attacking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can say that I can say that if um somebody tried to pull the gazebo thing, I would immediately pull out the 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 source that I have on my shelf and um fastball it at them. <laughs> it's like, do you know the definition of dodge? <laughs> You're gonna learn now. <laughs> was... At that time, at that time, everybody in everybody in that table had done some degree of stunt work. So we all knew we all knew we all knew the the fact that we were going to have to take hits. I got gotcha. you. Plus they plus they were the same group that I would often play Goldeneye with back in the day and we had a rule of if you picked odd job we're all allowed to kick you in the nuts. <laughs> That's the correct rule by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah, the idea being make the punishment so harsh that nobody would think about trying it. <laughs> There was one. There was one time somebody did, and after the match, I was like, "All right, get up. Time, time for the punishment. Everybody, get everybody, get in the line." You signed up for this, and um, tech. I guess he thought he could get away with it because he was wearing a cup. Uh, what I, what I, di what he didn't know is I never said how hard. That, <laughs> and um, well. You've got at least one person who's got a martial arts background, and I, and I told I told him, "Don't hold back when you kick him." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like how the um, like how Kevlar can protect you from getting shot at, from the bullet piercing you, but the motion transfer is still gonna hurt. Yeah, kinetic energy is a hell of a drug. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's gonna. F at, I mean, yeah, it's probably going to feel like getting punched in the chest, but at the same time, you're getting punched in the chest. Yeah. But by something moving the speed of a bullet. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back to sane things, given the given the page count and all that, what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window? Um, we have pretty much most of the uh, um book done we have some final touches to do some uh typos or clarity things to find uh but the bulk of the stuff is done um so in terms of pdf content we are soon uh in terms of physical copy uh we're aiming for about a year from now uh from now mm -hmm. maybe uh you know 10 to 12 months um for us to figure out that whole printing process um make sure that it actually 
looks good and physical paper um, and uh, be able to send them out uh, to the people who back our Kickstarter. A way to have holiday hell literally. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and whether the holiday is Halloween or Christmas, we feel like it fits. Yeah. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you guys for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. <laughs> and Of course, thank you again for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here <laughs> on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!